Good morning, church, and happy Easter. He is risen. Matthew 28, verse 6 says, He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Let's stand up and risen our wor er, worship our risen Savior this morning. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the light of inward shame. The fixed our eyes upon the cross and run to Him who showed great love and bled for. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Church, 
Come stand in the light. Our God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. He's God. Justified freely forever. One. 
one day he's coming, oh glorious day. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day. so worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Oh 
heads and pray with me this morning. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his life. We thank you, Lord, for the death on the cross. We thank you for his resurrection, God. Lord, we thank you for the truth of the resurrection, which means that every single thing is game for resurrection. Every dead heart, every dead relationship, every dead dream. We thank you, God, that we can shovel dirt on hopelessness because you are alive. So, Jesus, I pray that we would be a people of hope today and this week, God, that we would carry that hope out into a broken and hurting and needy world. God, would you make us vessels of your hope to a world who so desperately needs to encounter your love? We love you, Jesus, and we praise you, and it's in your name we pray and all of God's people said, amen. Okay, so we have no anchored kids today. Why? Because we love families so much that we want our really hardworking, dedicated anchored kids team to hang out and worship with their families. So thank you, anchored kids team, for serving week after week after week. We love you. Kids, we do have some stuff for you. There's some activities and a treat over here by Mr. Eugene, who can raise his hand and everybody can come see him and get an activity and a treat. Parents, listen, take a deep breath. Kids are wiggly. It's okay that they wiggle. We're glad that they're here. They might make a noise during church. It's also okay. They're allowed to make noises. We love kids. We love families. Pastor Joe has raised like 6,412 kids. It's no problem to him while he's preaching. If they make a little noise, if they wiggle, it's all good. We don't expect that you're going to sit still or straight. We're not that kind of church family. We're just pumped that you're here. We love you. Wiggle away. If you ask my kids, I actually preach better when they are wiggly, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I just want to invite you into this moment and realize that 
because of what God did through Jesus Christ, this moment, it's an eternal moment. Just put yourself in that place where we don't ever end. God has given us eternal life through Jesus Christ. So this moment, it's an eternal moment. And everything that we have has been so graciously given to us by God. If you're here for the first time, I'm so glad you're here. This is a super special Sunday for, for us as Christians celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our whole, our whole premise, our whole life is 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 founded on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you're going to hear a lot about that today, and I'm just so happy you're here. Our ushers are going to come through for this morning's offering. It's an opportunity for us as Christians to recognize the fact that God has given us all that we have, that we have a responsibility to love our neighbors and love the world through the church, and that we know that 90% blessed is better than 100% not. So our ushers are going to come through for this morning's offering. Forevermore, forever. 
God, we come to you and we pray that as best we can, we can hear from you. So that people who might be here this morning, watching online from home, people who are listening to these words and are far from you, come to believe that you love them so much you sent your son into this world to affirm that love. And to affirm your promise of grace and triumph over every issue, even death itself. Speak your message, God, into our lives of tragedy to triumph, death to life, and darkness to light. And it's in Christ we pray. Amen. This morning our passage that we're reading is from the account of Matthew, Matthew's first book in the New Testament. We're looking at the last chapter of Matthew, chapter 28. There are three events in all four Gospels. I don't know if you know, four Gospels, Gospels are, the word means good news. So if you're here this morning and you have heard about Christianity and it hasn't been favorable, it hasn't been good news, well, maybe you're getting the wrong brand of Christianity. It's good news. And... Um, the four Gospels are basically four biographies by eyewitnesses or the eyewitnesses scribed to the life of Jesus. And in each one of the four, there are three, three events that each Gospel writer writes about. There's lots of events, don't get me wrong, but there's three. One is the baptism of Jesus because it was uh, the initiation into his ministry, his public ministry. Two is the feeding of the 5,000. He provides perfectly for the crowds and teaches in that moment. And then third is the resurrection or the Holy Week events and accounts. This is one of those events, one of those accounts, and it's in Matthew's gospel. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. So we have this unique um, ability of CGI in movies and television to see things like, like uh, you ever see the Superman movie where he gets ready to take off and the whole ground shakes around him and then he takes off and the ground is... Well, this is kind of the reverse of that. If you can imagine an angel comes down and in such a way it causes the earth to quake... And the angel comes down to roll away the tomb stone because the tomb was hone out of a cave and there was a stone rolled in front of it. Big stone, hard to move. Angel, not a problem for an angel. But 
the earth shook. The resurrection wasn't, the angel wasn't rolling the, two, the stone away so Jesus could come out. Did you, you realize that? The angel came to roll the stone away so humanity could get in to see that the tomb was empty. The resurrection had happened. The angel came to open the tomb so that you and I, the women, everybody could come and see that Jesus is risen. So the angel comes down in verse 3. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid. Now these are Roman guards. They're like the, the Navy SEALs or, or you know, like they're, they're, they're a special crew because if you look back before in chapter 27, the religious leaders did not want anything to happen to this tomb. They wanted Jesus to stay put. He was dead. He needed to stay dead. So they thought the best way to do this was to get the, the, the Roman elite soldiers to seal the tomb and to stand guard. The guards were so afraid of this angel that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see in the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. This is like the mic drop moment, right? Now, the angel's like, okay, now I've told you, drop. Like his whole job was to go down to roll the tombstone away to tell these ladies that came to the tomb that he's not there and that he's risen. Don't be mistaken. Now I've told you, he says. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, where they will see me. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about reactions. Reactions in particularly of the people in this story. You had the the Roman guards that were there guarding this tomb. They were doing their job. They were simply told to, to go and guard the tomb. They didn't care. Their commanding officer said, go do this because you have to do it and don't let anything happen or something bad's going to happen to you. Like, do your job. So they went, and they didn't care. And then you had these the women um, they were followers of Jesus. Mary Magdalene, we know about. There's lots of stories about her and references to her in the Bible. But there, there's this other Mary, this Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And there's some debate in Christianity about, about whether that was Mary, the mother of Jesus, or Mary, uh, a, a cousin or a, a family member. Or, but, but they were there at the cross, and they saw Jesus die. They saw him crucified, and they saw him put in the cave, in the tomb, dead. 
and they had spices with them to anoint the body. So they were going early in the morning. You couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. That was Saturday. That's the seventh day of the week, the day of rest. So they got up early in the morning, and, and they went to the tomb to anoint or embalm this body with spices. Their reaction... initially was to not expect anything abnormal. They were probably wondering who, talking about who's going to move the stone from the tomb because it's large and they might not be able to do it. Their reaction that morning was one of love and compassion for someone who had died, who they expected to be dead. There was the reaction of the angel. The angel knew, had foreknowledge uh, of, or the action of the angel. The angel had foreknowledge of what was happening had faith and stated it with confidence. This is what, hey, I know why you're here and, and this is what's going on. Then the reaction of the women changed and, and then when they met Jesus, mm, it was powerful. What's your reaction to the, to the resurrection? In the world, there's, you know, if you think about reactions of, of people, right, you can, you have people who have, believe and have faith that Jesus ra is raised from the dead, is alive forevermore. Is, and then you have people who maybe aren't quite sure, they doubt it, so their reaction is one, well, maybe, maybe not. I'll hedge my bets, right? Then you have people who, it just doesn't matter. It's not part of my worldview, it's not part of my thing, they can do their thing, it's all right, go. And then, then you have... Um, maybe there's a level of ignorance, like I just don't know. One of the theological questions that gets asked every once in a while is, well, what happens to someone who dies that doesn't, never had the opportunity to receive Jesus, to never hear about them, they're living on some island somewhere, and you know, they just don't know. And I want to suggest to you that there are people outside the walls of this church that just don't know. They might think that Jesus is a bad thing, you know, organized religion doesn't have the best rap. I don't know if you'd know that. Didn't have the best rap when Jesus was around. I think that's why Jesus tried to correct it. He was like, these are my people. I go to the temple all the time. God wants you to love and to give and to be humble and to be meek and to build the community up around you and to point people to God, the sustainer and creator and, and, and giver of all things. And somehow, you know, our human side gets in, pride gets in, and, and, and greed gets in, and, and then you end up with people building, doing what they do, right? We build structures that we that support us and we don't want to tear them down ever because they're supporting us and then, and then you end up in organized religion and so I get it. But I also know a lot of people who have faith that work against letting that happen as hard as we can. Most of all, I know that Christianity, Jesus, is alive forevermore and will never stop. Nothing can stop him. Nothing can stop his message. 
denominations come and go churches come and go but the message of jesus in the transformational power the freedom we receive is incredible anyway i'm getting off track come back for come back in three weeks what's your reaction to the resurrection is it one of belief is it one of doubt is it you, you not not you, there's no guilt we're, we're just people trying to figure it out maybe you're here because someone dragged you here you know it's your your twice a year obligation christmas and easter it's okay but but what's your reaction take this moment and think about it do you believe in the resurrection because the women going to the tomb that morning they didn't believe in the resurrection and they followed Jesus for years the soldiers they never saw anybody come out of a tomb they weren't worried about what was happening in the tomb they were worried about what was happening outside the tomb If you have your Bible open, take a look at it with me, or if you, you can grab one out of the pews, or you open your Bible app, it's pretty. I just want to walk you through this real quick. There are three basic scenes that happen here. The one is that the angel opens the tomb. The next one is the women and the angel, the conversation that takes place between the women and the angel. And then thirdly, third is the uh is the women meeting jesus and in this first scene these big guys you know like i i envision like a whole army of the rock you know dwayne johnson the rock big huge wrestler guy or maybe even john cena it had to be pretty embarrassing for them the soldiers and scary because they had a job to do and all of a sudden the tombs open this angel came down and the earth shook and then they were like dead men how do you go tell your commanding officer that the only thing you told me to do it had to be embarrassing even more embarrassing than john cena at the oscars You didn't see the Oscars, did you? Then the angel comes to the women and he gives, he says nine pieces, he gives them nine pieces of information, nine pieces of foreknowledge. He says, and, and I get it, and you get it too, right? They come and the angel starts a conversation with them. The first thing he says is, don't be afraid. Because if he doesn't say that, you end up like dead. It's terrifying, scary. But he's like, no, 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 don't be afraid. Friendly. He says, one, I'm looking for, I know you're looking for Jesus. This because this was his tomb and they were on the way, right? That makes sense to me. Second, who was crucified? Well, that was public knowledge. Like that's why he was in the tomb and he was dead. Three. I opened the, I rolled the stone away to let you know if you look in there, he's not here. Okay, so now it starts, in my logic, it starts to get weird because I saw him, the women saw him be put in the tomb. They saw the stone. They, they knew he was supposed to be there and the angels up to this point okay, I'm tracking with you, right? You're looking for Jesus. He was crucified, but he's not here. Well, where is he? Well, he's risen. Okay, so I haven't been along the ride on this earth for very long compared to all time and all humanity, but I'm pretty sure that no one's predicted their own death and resurrection and pulled it off when the tomb was sealed and there were a whole bunch of guards in front of it. 
So what does that mean? He's risen. And then the angel says the fifth thing, piece of information he gives him. He goes, just as he said. And all of a sudden now I start, I, I've read the Gospels, I, I know, but the women were there. They heard Jesus saying, hey, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again in three days. Now they start to, now they, I, I can imagine that they, their reaction starts to change and they start to get excited and a little bit nervous and worried. And can it be? Is it true? And, and isn't this like God? If you're a Christian here this morning, isn't it true that God invites you to come and see? All the time. Come and see. Pray. Ask. Be free from your burdens and, and guilt. Just come and you'll see me at work. God's answer to prayer is never no. It's yes, it's not yet, or it's I have something even better for you. Just hang on, wait. Come and see. And then gives them a commission. Go and tell. Go and tell the disciples, information eight, that they need to rendezvous with Jesus in Galilee. And then he drops the mic, takes off. Now, I don't know about you. I, in my old age, I can't remember anything. So you can come up to me and you can share with me your name every day. And because of my own inner anxiety, I will never be able to remember your name until I get so embarrassed that it sticks in my head I do start to remember names the more I pray for you. So if you ask me to pray for you, then I'll remember your name quicker. But these women in this moment had to have so much anxiety. You have an angel that that is like lightning and all white, and the Roman soldiers are like laying on the ground, like, uh, you know, like they're on the ground, and, and they're like, Jesus isn't here. And you can imagine the anxiety. I would have been like to the angel, I would have been like, hey, let me go find a piece of paper and write down Galilee. Or hey, better yet, text me. Text me what you just told me because I'm not going to remember in like 30 seconds as soon as I start running. Then the scripture goes on to the third act or the third scene in this event. And they leave, and Matthew tells us that they, they left, if you read it right there, they left afraid with joy. Afraid with joy. And I couldn't quite, I wanted to give you a word that would describe that. So I went to chat GPT, and I asked it. I said, I said okay, artificial intelligence what words mean afraid but with joy and and it didn't give me anything it it was terrible it didn't help me at all and I mean I was using 4.0 not 3.5 so so it it gave me words like euphoric it seemed to hit hit the notes of either too much joy or too much fear And then I I realized that James Carey gave me the answer. He gave me the perfect illustration to express to you what a little bit of this would be. Not Jim Carey, the actor, James Carey. He's the executive director of the New Jersey Lottery. And he was in Neptune last week at the ShopRite talking about the person who won a billion dollars and bought their ticket there. He said a bunch of things that struck in my head, but 
to illustrate this point of the women leaving the tomb, I thought about how I would feel if I had that billion dollar ticket. How would you feel? There would be a sense of euphoria, yes. There would be a sense of joy. Maybe extreme joy. But I would be scared to death that I'd lose the ticket. I wouldn't know what to do with it to keep it safe because it was so special and precious. And you can imagine these women, they're leaving the tomb and they're like, triple checking the numbers on the ticket like really he wasn't there was that was you saw that too mary yeah mary i saw that didn't you see that there was nobody in there and the angel right there that really happened and and the the second guessing and and the the excitement that jesus is alive their friend the person that they, that, that they followed, the person that loves them, the person that's incredible and, and promised so much and was dead. And he's alive forevermore. You can imagine how that might feel. What would your reaction be this morning if you knew without a doubt that everything could change? What would you do? Or what would your reaction be if there was no guilt or death what would you do if you knew that it, it, no matter what you did, God would work it all out for the perfect? There was that story in the four Gospels that, that was told, you know, remember the three, one, the, the 5,000, the feeding of the 5,000. And it's very interesting, um, when I was reading it, thinking about, it's 5,000 men, the story tells us, so that they, they, were, they, were, they were with their families, or women and children there, there might have been 20,000 people, so can you imagine 20,000 people hanging out in a field, listening to Jesus teach and preach? Talk about squirrely kids. He preached all day. He preached so long that they got hungry, and Jesus is like, tell disciples, go get them, go get these 20,000 people things, something to eat. And they're like, are you kidding me, Jesus? And the story takes place from this dialogue between Jesus and the disciples, right? It's, it's him and the 12, and, and they're talking, and, and then, the, then, you know, well, we only have five loaves and two fish, and how are we going to feed all these people? And the story is fantastic. But here's the thing. I have two brothers, If we were there and we were hungry, we would be cranky as kids. And we would be poking at each other, wrestling with each other. We wouldn't have much of a reaction to Jesus at all. It might be more towards our parents, like, why are we here? Why did you drag me here? This is a waste of my time. I could be playing football with my friends back in Galilee. You know? But the story tells us that everyone that was there was filled and that there were lots of leftovers. I want to invite you this morning to know that no matter what your reaction was to the res resurrection of Jesus coming in here, 
that if you invite God in, you will be filled. He will fill you perfectly. Even if your reaction coming in is like poking and why am I here and somebody dragged me here and, or I don't even know if this is true. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundational the foundational cornerstone of Christian faith because he, he conquered death. No other religion claims that their leader actually died and came back from the dead. The implications of that are that Jesus is alive today and forevermore. He is risen, and this is a person who is a perfect provider. This is a person who loves you. Doubts and reactions and, and everything. Not because you're super special to the world, but because you're super special to God who created you. As, I, as, we, as we wrap this up, we're going to have communion. But I want, you, I want you to just think about what it would be like if you knew, if you believed without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus could change everything. Who would you invite to that? Who would you invite into that relationship with a risen Lord and Savior who has the power to change everything? In 2019, Taylor Swift released an album called Lover, and the album was about her personal transformation of life. It, the album is not necessarily a Christian album or a spiritual album, so forgive me for doing this, but I'm going to spiritualize something for you from her album. In the last song of the album, it, she, she, she intentionally put this song Daylight at the end because all of a sudden it, it, it signified her awakening. The course of the song goes like this. And I, I envision that, that when we come face to face with Jesus, the risen Lord, this, I think, is the reaction. I don't want to look at anything now that I saw you. I can never look away. I don't want to think of anything else now that I thought of you. Things will never be the same. I've been sleeping so long in a 20-year dark night, and now I am wide awake, and now I see daylight. I only see daylight. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is, is an event that changes everything. It doesn't matter what your reaction is or was coming into worship this morning. Because it happened. And God wants nothing more than to love people, love you, and invite people into a relationship that begins an eternal journey of freedom and love in Jesus Christ. It's kind of like going from a 20-year dark night into the daylight. 
And it's not necessarily about our reaction to him as much as it's his reaction to us. And we see that when he sat with the disciples and he he was at his last supper with them and he took bread and he broke the bread and he gave it to them and he didn't ask them how they felt about this. He said to them, this is my body which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the supper was over and he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to them and he said, take, the, take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. My blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. He invites us all to his table of perfect provision and love. This morning we're going to celebrate communion. With There's four stations. There's two here and two back there. We'll celebrate by intinction. That's the, the ancient word for taking, and maybe it's a modern word, I don't know. But you take the We'll take the matzah and dip it in the grape juice and pass it to you. And it is the body and blood of Christ. Broken for you, shed for you, because he loves you. And he is alive today and forevermore. Let us pray. God, we call on you and your Holy Spirit to, to make these gifts of bread and vine, the body and blood of Christ, for us this morning so that we might be one church, one people, celebrating and sharing the good news and resurrection of Jesus Christ, being the light in the world. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I invite you forward to receive communion.
invite you to stand for our closing. You know, for centuries on Easter, the, the congregational leader, the pastor, whoever was up here would say, Christ is risen, and the congregation would yell back, Christ is risen indeed. Awesome. Go forth with the blessing of resurrection today and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Have a great week. Happy Easter. God bless you. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride. greater still the calm assurance this child can face on certain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I And then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know He reigns because He can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and life is worth the living just because he lives and life is worth Amen. Happy Easter, everybody.